Good afternoon and welcome back to our next and final panel today at our BioEPJ Summit. Our panel now is the future of MedTech, innovation and acceleration. And to moderate this panel, I'd like to introduce Pat Schaefer. He is the managing director of FTI Consulting and someone we worked very closely with recently on an exciting project you'll hear more about. Hi, Pat. Hi, Emma. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, work with this panel. Um, it's it's very interesting. I, I, there's so much exciting stuff happening in med tech and, and bringing innovation to, to cures for patients. Um, but there's so many challenges too, challenges like funding, uh, issues around IP ownership uh, and the whole regulatory labyrinth. So uh, one of the things we'll be doing with the panel today is exploring um, you know, some of the ways that BioEPJ and the region can uh, accelerate innovation. So I'm gonna introduce uh, the panel right now and, and uh, present the bios, and then we'll jump right into the discussion. So Emma Schwartz is president of the Medical Center of the Americas Foundation and CEO of Bio El Paso Juarez. The MCA developed the region's first biomedical incubator, the Cardwell Collaborative, and the first freestanding mental health clinic for the Veterans Administration. The MCA also works to harness the life sciences industry for the region through multiple paths. Its innovation center, devised product development lab, Bio El Paso Juarez, representing the bio national, binational medical device manufacturing industry, the MCA Clinical Trials Consortium, the MCA Healthcare Think Tank, and STEM camps. She received her BA in human biology, concentrating in comparative health policy from Stanford University, and her MPH in health services management from UCLA where she was a Foley and Lardner Fellow. Ryan Pierce is a venture partner at SB Health Investors MedTech Convergence Fund, co-founder and CEO of Nine, and a lecturer in bioengineering at Stanford where he teaches BioE70Q, medical device innovation, and sits on the faculty of Stanford Biodesign. In earlier roles, Ryan has served as a VP of Design and Innovation at Ventus Medical, VP of Business Development at Loma Vista Medical, a healthcare investor at DeNovo Ventures and Rock Health, and a product designer at Concentric Medical and the Foundry Zephyr Medical. An inventor of over 30 US issued patient, patents, Ryan has designed FDA cleared devices to treat sleep apnea and stroke. Ryan earned a BS in mechanical engineering from MIT, an MS, in mechanical engineering from Stanford University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Julio Chu is the founder and CEO of CISA Group, a global provider of medical device services and visionary business leader bringing advances to the medical manufacturing industry. He also serves on the advisory board of Bancomex Development Bank and BBVA Compass Commercial Bank. While working as a banker on US-Mexico projects, Mr. Chu was one of the first to recognize the advantages of combining the economics of the El Paso Juarez region with the manufacturing supply chains of regulated industries. With hometown roots straddling both sides of the El Paso Juarez border, Mr. Chu successfully established Saiza Medical in 1983 with the region's economic advantages in mind. He received a BS in electrical engineering from the University of Texas at El Paso and an MBA from the Simon Graduate School of Business at the University of Rochester in New York. And finally, Alfredo Nolasco has led an international career working at executive levels in institutional and corporate affairs. He has experience in both the public and private sectors where he has held senior positions in government affairs and the creation of strategic alliances. He highlights his role as General Director of Promotion of Special Economic Zones, Chief Representative of Bombardier, and General Director of the Mesoamerica Project. In the, very, in the area of investment promotion, Alfredo participated in the state of Chihuahua in attracting companies related to the aerospace sector in 2006. As General Director of Bombardier, he contributed 
to the development of supply chains in Bahio and Hidalgo. Mr. Nolasco has a degree in international relations from El Colegio de Mexico, Mexico, is Master of Science, Political Economy from the London School of Economics, and a graduate of the French National School of Administration. So with that, uh, I think we'll jump right into our panel. Uh, you can see we have some distinguished uh, guests here. I'm going to open uh, with a question to uh, Ryan. In your role as a venture capitalist and innovator, what trends do you see in MedTech and what challenges do you see in MedTech? And, and taking into account uh, COVID-19 and what that impact that has had on all this. Yeah, uh, we'll start with the funding landscape. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, there are um, there are a lot of dollars available to, uh, to go to work in med tech. Uh, funding and, and M&A had been fairly flat uh, from 2018 through 2020, um, but it seems to be uh, uh, at a pace about twice that this year, uh, if we just look at the first half of the year. Um, so that's obviously good for people who are raising money. Uh, areas of high interest uh, would include non-invasive monitoring, neurology, imaging. I think robotics is especially interesting. Um, at the fund that I'm involved with right now, the MedTech Convergence Fund through SV Health Investors, we're especially interested in technology that can move care to a lower cost setting. So if you think about the technology solutions or, or uh, tools that would enable that, we're looking at telehealth, smart devices, which I think we need to think about those not just as, as being able to diagnose uh, remotely, but even treat remotely. Uh, supported by predictive analytics, obviously sensor technology, all those are conspiring in a way to create uh, the kind of opportunities we're looking at at MCF. I'll note that as we look to move care outside of the setting, outside of a supervised setting, um, it's really important that we understand the patient well at a behavioral level, at a human level, um, as individuals. And uh, the interesting angle around that to me, uh, zooming way out, is that if you think about who's really good at knowing individuals and knowing behavior, um, it's big tech. Uh, it's Google, it's Amazon, it's Apple. And so it'll be interesting to see how their interest continues to evolve or disappear uh, in healthcare, given that they have this core competency of understanding individual behavior that will intersect with healthcare's interest in uh, individualizing care and moving it into the home where those, the, where those tech products are, are most often used. Um, you know, the toolboxes for MedTech uh, or the tools for MedTech, as I mentioned yesterday, are getting better between 3D printing, getting cheaper, getting faster. There's a backlog of overlooked needs uh, that I think are finally getting caught up on, overlooked areas, innovators. So all those trends, um, I think, are working in our favor. You asked also about COVID. Um, the most obvious impact of COVID is, is uh, or the most obvious manifestation, I think, system-wide is just the advent of telehealth. Um, McKinsey did a study on uh, counting insurance claims um, assigned to telehealth codes, and they're up 38x since February 2020. Um, it's hard to imagine that we could have predicted that uh, in late 2019. We all knew it would happen eventually, but this has obviously accelerated uh, telehealth. And then if you break it down by sector, obviously some uh, areas of medicine are more conducive than others. 50% of psychiatry visits at this point are telehealth. Um, looking more specifically at negatives and positives, obviously for med tech, postponing elective cases uh, have a short-term negative impact. Um, clinical trial en enrollment was definitely affected. Um, thinking more broadly, I worry a little bit about the distrust of science that we've seen emerge in particular areas, you know, kind of the, the bifurcation there um, as a product designer, because I want to design things that are uh, that are judged on data and judged well by experts. Um, and if we have to accommodate um, more mythical opinions on healthcare and on what works as product designers, I worry that we have to make compromises on what's actually best for the patients. Um, that said, on the positive side, uh, I think we've reset our understanding of what's possible. You look at how quickly the development uh, for vaccines progressed. Um, we look at how quickly FDA and CDC, you know, in the grand scheme of things, uh, did their regulatory reviews. So now we know it can be done quickly. And then we think about how, how can that speed be scaled to more products, not just a, a small set of vaccines. Um, you know, I think on the, when it comes to STEM education, uh, the last year and a half will only 
validate further the need to not just educate kind of the best of the best when it comes to scientists, engineers, doctors, but to educate the broader public on science um, so that people making local decisions for themselves, their families and the communities uh, have those tools available to them and sort of that philosophy available to them. And then finally, um, as an educator, I, you know, teaching the freshmen and sophomores that I do at, at Stanford, um, I've been really inspired to see this spark among them, uh, this desire to go fix problems. You know, even those who have not gotten sick, have not lost family members to COVID, you know, at, at, at best had to spend a year in their, in their childhood bedroom they weren't expecting to, to spend. So that's that, I see the motivation that that's created in them to work on meaningful problems and not to leave it to uh, the so-called adults uh, to fix them. So I think those, those positives I hope will uh, produce returns for years to come. Great, and to follow on first, Ryan, um, how can a, a cluster or a region harness those trends to build the industry in that area? Yeah, you know, I, I, I kind of think of, of, of clusters as the products of all the right ingredients being in the right place at the right time. And, you know, I'll put an asterisk on the word place. You know, in Silicon Valley, you had critical masses of co-founders coming together. You had willing capital to support that. Um, and now and you have, in, in MedTech, you had the you know, premier medical centers, UCSF, Stanford, um, nearby, um, you know, today, I think those ingredients haven't necessarily changed, but the necessity of having them all in the same place, they've changed, not, not all in the same amount, but, um, they've changed. And, you know, I think there's still something magical about providing a context for smart people to come together and create a team. Um, and then fundamentally for manufacturing, uh, that's probably the least mobile of the ingredients if you're making products is, is the manufacturing line. And that's why I think you know, regions that can provide those two things will be at a stronger relative advantage than they used to be because the actual location, once the team has identified itself, the actual location where they're executing doesn't matter as much. On a VC side for the last year and a half with MCF, I'd say 97%, 98% of the meetings with entrepreneurs have been by Zoom. So it doesn't really matter whether they're down the street or across the country, and it doesn't matter if their team is all together or in different places. They're gonna have their, each, their own windows on the screen anyway. So um, at the same time, there needed to be some context in the first place for them to come together and know each other in the first place. So I don't, I don't think the ingredient list is changing. I think the importance and the constraints assigned to each of those ingredients is changing in a way that ultimately favors context for the right people to come together, get to know each other in the first place, presence of a good medical center, you know, within reasonable proximity. And then, you know, ultimately, again, manufacturing is the last thing to move. So you have an advantage there that, that might be the last advantage to fundamentally change. Very good, thank you. Emma, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the work you've been doing at um, MCA and Bio El Paso Juarez to accelerate uh, MedTech innovation. Well, it's it has certainly been a journey. Um, and I think that the journey started, I, I'm getting a little feedback. Is anyone else getting that feedback? Maybe we can mute when the other's not talking and perfect. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys. Um, so yeah, we've been on a journey and I'll tell you that the MCA started in 2006, but in, in about 2009, uh, one of the city's economic development uh, corporations commissioned a study by a consulting group to try to figure out how to grow our life sciences industry in this region. And um, it, because it, we weren't being very successful at recruiting life sciences companies. The conclusion of that um, study was that we needed to focus more narrowly on medical devices because of the strong engineering education we had because of the manufacturing industry in this region. It made a lot more sense. And we had this nascent, actually not even that nascent, maybe a 20 year uh, old medical device manufacturing industry that was growing out of the larger manufacturing industry in, in Ciudad Juarez. And so I think understanding ourselves as a community was the first important step and then looking at all the different pieces of the innovation ecosystem that we've needed to help fertilize, grow, and evolve to make this a place that is supportive of medical, med tech, 
innovation all the way through manufacturing. And so we built the Cardwell Collaborative Biomedical Incubator so we could have wet lab and dry lab space available to innovators. We launched our Innovation Center that is an incubator and accelerator supporting innovators of all kinds in our region. We launched Bio El Paso Audits to help organize the medical device manufacturing and supplier industry. Um, we also recently launched Devise, a product development lab for medical devices and supplies that hopefully will kind of bring the innovation closer to the manufacturing with providing that center portion of product development. We have had a clinical trials consortium now in our community for several years because clinical research is also a very important part of that. And we just launched a clinical trials academy to grow the number of PIs and uh, clinical research coordinators and sites in our region. We have also launched a healthcare think tank to more closely engage the medical providers and hospitals in our region. Uh, we also launched just this last fall, the Ecotone Investment Fund, looking at early stage companies in our region, outside our region, to try to bring more med tech innovation closer to, to home and hopefully support them. Pat, you, you all and your team conducted a, a binational study of the medical device ecosystem a couple of years ago, also just trying to make sure that we understand who the players were, how we function as a binational unique industry, how do we then promote that and get innovation closer to our manufacturing ecosystem? So it has been a, a very long journey, I think a very purposeful journey at elevating different pieces of the ecosystem at the appropriate time in history. And you know, what I tell people all the time is you can't just lift the ecosystem. You have to lift it bit by bit by bit and then go back to the beginning and lift that again a little bit more each time. And here we are over a decade into this process and I'm really excited about the ecosystem that we have and, and the collaboration that we have and really the prominence that the industry is making in this region. And the timing was perfect when COVID hit that we could really become a partner to the rest of the world in, in providing PPE and other medical devices that were needed at a really critical time. And I think it also really proved our case that we are capable of doing this. We need to continue to invest in this industry thoughtfully and, and strategically um, but, but we are definitely seeing innovation come together with manufacturing and provide a lot of value in the space. And so very exciting time. We, we have a lot more work to do, but we have been planting the seeds and, and things are growing. Let me ask a following question. Both you and Ryan talked about so many elements that need to come together in order to make innovation flourish. Um, you talked about, uh, medical centers, you talked about manufacturing, um, and then you've been responding with think tanks and, and other tools. Can you share your feelings on where you've been able to make the most progress and where you have encountered the biggest constraints to success? Um, goodness, okay, so progress, you know, um, it's it's interesting because it, it happens in, in small little increments and then all of a sudden you look back at 10 years and you're like, wow, we've gone a long way. Um, but it's hard to say that it's, it's big progress. I, I do think that we've been very successful in getting EDA grants, uh, Economic Development Administration grants, to support our innovation center, to start up our seed fund, to help fund the engineering for the Cardwell Collaborative Building, to start up our medical device product development lab. So that endorsement by this federal agency that is looking at economic strategies around the, the country and validating that we're taking the right steps to grow this industry is important. I think that the, the fact that we've gotten support of um, the members of BioEPJ who, who pay their membership fees, who show up to committee meetings, who lend their minds and their talents and their hearts to, to collaborating and not just working within their own institution, but how do we come together for the greater of, of all, which will benefit all. I think those are some of the, the wins I think uh, that, that I see. You know, it's, it's about, everything is about people and relationships ultimately. We wanna start an industry. We wanna put more manufacturing plants. It's about trust, relationships, and, and good ideas coming together with some execution, right? So. So these, these platforms like BioEPJ, like the summit, reaching out to each other, meeting, supporting uh, innovators, you know, uh, doing business development for our region, it's, it's coming together and it's because of the people involved. 
Great, thank you. So obstacles. Um, I, I would say people don't look to our region as a place for innovation. And we have some reputation issues that we need to, uh, to, to help get over. Um, I think people sometimes, uh, again, don't look to El Paso for innovation. Think of it as a dusty town that's not going to contribute. We know that's not true. And when we bring people in to see what we're doing and what we're capable of, they're, they're highly impressed. But we do need to work, um, I think, collabor collaboratively on, on combating that negative reputation. Great. Thank you. Um, Julio, I wonder if you could give us your perspective as a contract manufacturer. Uh, what does innovation mean to you um, at, at Size of Medical? Okay. Sure. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Pat. Uh, uh, well, you know, what does innovation mean to say, so, you know, we're a, a full service provider in the contract manufacturing business space and for medical devices. And, and CESA is involved throughout the life cycle of a product that is from design to manufacturing to sterilization to finished product. We're embedded from the beginning of a product's, product's uh, life. And depending on the customer uh, who decides whether they bring CESA into the initial design and development of a product or, a, or after a product has been, a design has been frozen and they want us to take it into the next steps, possibly manufacturability of the product. Uh, you know, we sometimes come into the uh, into the uh, 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 participate in, in the uh, generation of a new uh, generation of an existing product uh, as they evolve and as they want to add uh, you know more technology or as they want to want to make that product uh, better uh, as a medical device. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so we participate in that. That's uh, part of what we do. You know, we, we were manufacturers uh, and uh, basically grew up as such. Uh, and uh, 12 years ago, in 2009, I decided that we had to go back in the, in, in the supply chain cycle of a product uh, as manufacturers and, and get involved in the part that's designed, that's where innovation happens. That's where engineers become more than industrial engineers, they become design engineers, right? And how did we do that? We train our people to think in that manner. Uh, I think, uh, you know, for the last 12 years, as I said, we have supported customers with design and development of products. Uh, we help with the design file. We take a final design to the next level. Uh, which, as I said earlier, it might be manufacturability. In the last three years, we've made uh, three acquisitions uh, uh, that, that have helped us add to that offering to the market. Uh, we've added capabilities in, in, in uh, injection molding and extrusion. Uh, we expanded in prototyping. Uh, in fact, we, two of the, our three acquisitions are in the Bay Area, uh, which, uh, as you know, I, uh, everyone knows, and in particular Ryan, uh, it's one of the premier centers of innovation, not just in 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 uh, uh, software and, and things of that nature, but also in medical devices. Uh, and we wanted to be a, an active participant in that part. We wanted to uh, to provide our services. Uh, you know, the the. Uh, <clears throat> And, and uh, we also made a uh, uh, made a, an acquisition where we're basically doing prototyping. So we're helping uh, customers that have developed a new medical device or are in the process of developing one, and we get involved in the prototyping part of it. We also uh, our second uh, our another acquisition we did in the Bay Area was in, in metals, and that followed an acquisition we did three years in New Jersey of a premier company that have, for the last 20 years, participated in nitinol and other alloys that are where most of the implantables that go into the body come from, basically stents and in, 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 uh, that, that are now have gone from being stents for the heart or the arteries or, or the uh, endovascular now into, into peripheral areas. So we wanted to be in that part combined 
uh, with our ability to produce the, 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 the uh, uh, delivery systems, which are the catheters that take and travel to the body. And the bust. Oh, okay. So then, uh, basically, uh, that's why that's what it, it, you know. That's part of what innovation means for us, Pat. It is. Uh, it, it's important for us to participate in the design and development customers. And, and, and I'll tell you one other thing is, you know, we we come from the manufacturing side. We have the ability to scale product. When we gone to acquisitions, most of these companies through the years have seen a lot of business come through them and then go somewhere else because they no, don't have the ability to scale. So the, the, uh, what, what I try to do here is basically come uh, participate in the whole supply chain, being in the initial design development innovation part, work with the companies in the innovation and walk with them into the manufacturing side where you then go from a few to thousands and scaling the product and scaling the product either in our Mexico facilities or in our, in our Euro, Eastern European facility, which is again, uh, labor competitive areas that, that can take all that technology. So that's, that's why innovation is important to us, not just because we, we embedded ourselves in the whole supply chain, but also in, in the, you know, uh, both Ryan and, and Emma talked about that collaboration, why have we not developed more innovation in our or, or more design development in our area? And, and, and again, I think we're having a little bandwidth issue here. Yeah, well, we have been, uh, barely. I'm sorry, I guess I'm back. So <clears throat> we have uh, manufacturing, we have the medical centers, we have the universities, but we have not been able to join those silos. And that's what I looked at when I mentioned earlier that I, as a company, went back and, and, and embedded ourselves into design and, and development. You know, there was, no, uh, there was no path to follow other than the one that we made for ourselves as we took engineers that had been exposed to manufacturing into the design and development of, of, of the product. What I call, <clears throat> I took them into an area where they had to understand the science behind what we did. And, and, and that's uh, to some extent where we're lucky. You know, we have the best engineers when it comes to manufacturing, but we need to expose them and we need to convince those companies that are already here that El Paso Juarez is an area, an ecosystem that has the basis for development, design and development, just as, as Ryan said, in, in the Bay Area, <clears throat> you have a lot of elements, but you don't have the manufacturing, right? And, and I think that's what we need to either partner, which is what I'm trying to do in, in situating ourselves in the Bay Area, and because as, as he said, you don't have to be now, you know, Zoom has come to show us that we don't all have to be within a few miles of each other in order to, to make collaboration and, and, and have all those pieces of, of the uh, supply chain put together. Another area that's of great importance for us in that part is that and the other reason that we wanted to be in that initial part is because, you know, we talked about Mexico as a very small percentage of the participation in the uh, supply chain. 4% over the last 30, 40, 50 years. The reason for that is because it is when you're working with the design engineers that the supplier decisions are made. And that's where you want to be. If we want to grow that 4%, we need to do more design and development that clearly impacts the products that we are manufacturing in our area. Okay. So that's, so I, uh, Pat, that's, that's why I'm in innovation because that's where the, the value, true value add is at. You know, if I was to graph function uh, against, uh, uh, functional against value, you know, we're in the lowest part and, and we gotta go up in that supply chain part to where design and development is, is 
which is where the true, the largest value, not just at the, at, at the time of design and development, but the impact that it has in the life cycle of the product. And that's why the importance to say so of, uh, of innovation. Great. Uh, Julio, I'm going to have uh, uh, one quick follow-up question. You're in a very unique position as a contract manufacturer to have collaborated with many different companies and, and participated in their innovation process. Can you identify any uh, secret sauce or uh, element that makes one company's innovation or design team more successful than another's? You know, I, I'll, I'll, it, it, there is not one uh, exact science. I think a lot has to do more with with the uh, with the type of product that there is. I've seen companies that do it better than others. Uh, and in some cases, is is uh, either because they're thinking more into. And I guess I would say, where do you measure that success? Do you measure the success? at the design level or do you measure the success at the manu manufacturing level, you know? If there are companies that design for man manufacturability, well, there are companies that all their concern is about designing a product in, 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 in but so there has to be a, a combination of, of, of those. And I've seen companies that, the companies that I see that are the most successful are the ones that think in terms of the whole supply chain, not just compartmentalized and in one piece of the pie, but in all the different combinations from design, from securing your suppliers, from manufacturing, and obviously from your marketing and sales of that company. Those that think in terms of the whole supply chain are the ones that I admire the most. Great, thank you for that insight, I appreciate it. Alfredo, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about Chihuahua Global and uh, the region's innovation ecosystem, please. Well, th th thank you, uh, thank you, Pat, and, and hello to my fellow panelists. I am overwhelmed because the, the, the things that I am hearing from you guys, the specialists, are exactly the, the issues that, uh, that makes uh, our everyday work. Chihuahua Global, we are, we are the sales guys of the region, of the state of Chihuahua, and our mandate is basically to attract investment to, to not only to, to Juarez El Paso, but, uh, but to Chihuahua as a whole. Um, at, at the end of the day, I, I guess and I presume that uh, uh, the first thing that we have to do in order to talk about innovation is to see where we are actually standing you know and uh, and we have to recognize some of the of the strengths and some of the weaknesses that we have as a region the 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 the, the weaknesses as uh, ryan was saying is that uh, the ideas are 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 being uh, done somewhere else and and basically you can see the concentration that it's in the west coast you can have a, a some some innovation and some thoughts that are being made in in asia europe eastern coast whatever on the other hand, uh, and I, I want to, to recall a, a, an essay uh, written back in, in 88 by Marshall Berman that uh, used to say, all that is solid melts into air. I guess that we are now into the exact opposite because all that is uh, air has to melt into solid. And the, these ideas basically today, the things that are happening in the minds of very, very clever people all around the world, at the end of the day, we don't have to forget that we have to produce that. And we have to do that in, a, in, a, uh, a, in an effective manner. And that brings us to economies. And the economies, it's, it's very simple. In order to produce, you have to be cost effective. And in order to be cost effective, you have to create all this uh, ecosystem of, uh, of capabilities. And you have to talk about the human resources. You have to talk about the material resources. You have to talk about the financial resources. So if you mix that and you put that into, into the equation, then it makes perfect sense of actually uh, considering El Paso Juarez as a very interesting uh, area to invest for, uh, for, for, for this kind of innovative uh, sectors. We here in Chihuahua, we are basically focusing on six sectors, uh, aerospace, which is a no-brainer. Basically, it's very sexy to talk about planes. 
Uh, we are moving very quickly to the part of electromobility, not only uh, automotive industry and, uh, and uh, the, the background that we have in this area. It's very important, especially in the electric and, and electromechanical area. Of course, all the part of uh, electromechanical computing, maybe you don't know, but uh, the state of Chihuahua represents about 40% of the output of the computers that are actually sold in the US. So it's a, it's a big figure that nobody actually uh, tells uh, in, a, in an active manner. Uh, the fourth sector it has to do with uh, with you guys. I mean, with uh, with uh, the medical devices, biotechnologies. I mean, we are betting strongly on this sector. Then we have logistics that it's uh, extremely important in order to make flourish all these businesses and agro agro industry. But I'm not going to be touching upon that. So um, again, we have to see where we are. And and uh, and Chihuahua El Paso, we have a very interesting combination because we have on one side muscle and we have on the other side brains but we are not either in the in the in the big brain or the big muscle area but we have the possibility of being a very cost effective destination and this cost effective destination depends and relies on the uh, using and connecting the dots between the two regions I have been working with some other uh, clusters, and uh, I can tell you that I like very much what uh, Bio El Paso Juarez is doing, because it's actually a real and operating binational organization. And we are actually taking uh, advantage and profiting from working together. So, for example, when we uh, when we talk about innovation centers, when we think about uh, uh, development centers, sometimes we think that everything is on the U.S. side. The reality is that on the Mexican side, especially, for example, on the place that uh, uh, the, the 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 ones that will have this uh, uh, this uh, presential meeting later on. It's, uh, it's part of the ecosystem of innovation of the Mexican Instituto Nacional, Instituto Politecnico Nacional. So these guys, uh, we do have some resources that are not available nearby in the western part of Texas or southern New Mexico. You have to go about 1,000 kilometers away in order to, 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 to make, for example, testing, destructive testing, uh, certifications, and, and whatever. So we can basically use infrastructure, the human resources, the talents on both sides of the, of the border in a city that it's actually the same city. El Paso and Juarez Historically, they have always been the same city. It's El Paso del Norte. So, uh, uh, so I guess that that puts us in a very unique opportunity of actually trying and fetch the best, the best, uh, the best opportunities. And uh, I, I just want uh, to make another uh, very short comment about one of the biggest assets that we have in this region, and this is the human resources, the talent. Uh, us in Chihuahua Global. I don't like to talk about the thousands of engineers that graduate from universities because that's 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 a bunch. We like to speak about the top tier, the best engineers that are produced or technicians that are produced for the sectors that we're interested. And here, of course, uh, we have to change the perception that we are this dusty town. I agree with Emma completely. I mean, we're in the middle of nowhere, but in the center of everything. So, uh, so this uh, this uh, uh, this combination uh, brings us first. We have to change the perception. The second is that we have to pursue the retention of our talent. Unfortunately, we form the best engineers, and you can see those in in many sectors. But they immigrate either to California or to Houston or to Mexico City or whatever. And we are not creating the conditions of actually retaining. And if we don't retain the talent, when we won't have innovation. So uh, I guess that uh, this, uh, this uh, allows me to stop here and to contribute to the discussion with you guys, because again, I am thrilled. I am excited of picking on your brains because your ideas are going to be uh, making me a better sales guy of the region. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alfredo. You know, you, you mentioned that it's essentially one city, El Paso and Juarez. Um, I've, I've been there and, and I enjoyed working with Emma and her team, but very noticeable is this thing called the border that separates the city. 
and uh, there's a separation of language, but but also uh, at the time I was there, uh, it, was, it was difficult and time consuming to even get through the border. I wonder if we could all talk a little bit about how we can mitigate the constraints that the border uh, presents or uh, take advantage of the opportunities that that border presents. Any any thoughts on that? And I'd invite anyone to jump in on this. Well, okay. well Emma, go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I, I think, Pat, when you came, we were having some migrant crisis issues and there were really long lines and all of that. And, and, and definitely something we need to work on. But what's interesting is now reflecting on COVID's impact on the global supply chain and what's happening at Long Beach. And it's a lot harder right now to get something from China than even if we're having our worst day on the El Paso Juarez border, it's still easier to get something across, right? So I think that's that's point number one. And um, for a long time, I've been trying to find another word to describe the border because I hear I feel like the word border is very divisive. And, and so this is where that, that word ecotone came in that we're using to describe our fund. An ecotone is a biological term where two, uh, or a scientific term where two biological bodies come together, like an ocean and a beach and a tide pool is created. So this area of more innovation and diversity. And that's what I feel El Paso and Juarez are. It's not that there's a line that, two, you know, that are separating these two countries. Here on the border, we get to take advantage of two different human resource pools, two different cost structures, two different sets of taxes, two different sets of, of um, you know, of laws and policies. And if we're able to identify the, the best of each world and make this ecosystem work most together, we create this wonderful ecotone. As far as our fund is concerned, we're doing that with Silicon Valley companies. How can we support Silicon Valley companies with what's available in El Paso and Juarez to create a more rich environment for everybody? But that that's my thoughts on that. No, and let me jump right right on that. I mean, yes, there is a physical barrier, there is a wall, there is a river, but in reality, the exchanges of people and the mobility that exists between the two cities it's enormous. I mean, the, just now, right now, I was looking on the on the time for crossing the border after 20 months of having closed that that uh, that physical barrier. It takes 10 minutes to cross. So it's nothing. I mean, you can have a, a, a larger traffic jam in the I-10, uh, sorry, the I-5 in San Francisco. Uh, that is that is for sure. Uh, but here, the advantage is that the, the barrier, it's a state of mind at the end of the day. At the end of the day, what you have here is that you have a city that it's a bicultural city. So uh, the idea that you have a bilingual community that actually communicates and understands each other it's a great advantage and emma is completely right there are some advantages of actually making and having business in mexico and that's cost effectiveness that 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 is for sure there are some processes that it makes no sense to actually do that in 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 the u.s side however there are other processes that makes no sense in making them in mexico for example sterilizations or certification of other of of, of other uh, um, issues so i guess that we are complementary because we are right on the sweet spot of making business sense. Uh, and, and, and this is true uh, because we don't want, actually, and again, I go to my perception issue, we don't want to be seen as the low-cost uh, maquiladora place where you are going to be having the sweatshop of, of the 21st century. That's not true. Uh, if you come to Mexico and you see the performance of the, in, in, of the enterprises, like the one of Julio that you have here in Mexico, or you have the quality controls or the commitment and the compliance that we have with the uh, OECD standards, then you realize that it's better to work together. And, 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 and the barriers, they're just uh, imaginary. At the end of the day, trade goes, uh, goes through, uh, people goes through, culture goes through. So uh, I guess that if we see the whole border, and with this I will stop, the only place that you have an equitative and equivalent size of business and population, it's El Paso Juarez. So let's profit from that. If I may add, Pat, you know, I think that that uh, you know, we just opened the border, but business continued pretty much the same, even with the border closed. Uh, and, and I tell you, you know, basically, 
the border is is uh, I think I think Afrel said is is imaginary from this standpoint. I have uh, Mexican design engineers that have to interact with our design engineers in New Jersey and in California. And I cannot, if I want to keep him, I cannot pay him a salary as if they're in Mexico. I have to pay him the same as the people that, that they either supervise or that's in the U.S. or that sometimes they they report to in 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 the, in the U.S. But in most cases, you know, so, and, and it is not, innovation doesn't cut. I called earlier the understanding of the science behind what they make. You know, Alfredo mentioned something of great importance. 65% of our jobs, at least in what is 2,000 and 2,000, uh, 220,000 jobs right now depend on the combustion engine. That's going away in eight years for gone, gone. What are we gonna do with those uh, 220,000 jobs? You know, we need to change those. And we have this captive audience of all these medical devices that we need to convince that they can make design and development in our area. And by our area, I mentioned El Paso, what is, you're gonna to have to pay what you have to pay in order to keep, but it can be done. And that's what's going to create innovation. That's what's going to create the opportunity. Right now, you know, we can partner with areas in, in companies that are in the Bay Area. I'm doing that and I'm bringing the manufacturing part, the scalability of their products here and supporting their, their design. But we need to do more of that. And we need to, and that's what's going to create the jobs and the opportunities on both sides of the border. It is going to help take our region to the next level. If I can jump Leo, in can I... for Ryan. <laughs> Ryan, you're you're not from here, right? And we, we've introduced El Paso Juarez's ecosystem to you, but you're you're the penultimate innovator in medical devices, right? So what are your thoughts? Did did you were you aware of what was happening in El Paso and Juarez? And and through these conversations we've been having, how how do you envision collaborating with El Paso and Juarez with Silicon Valley innovators? Um no, I was not previously aware of what was happening there. Um, and if I think about how I would envision or what would convince me to go there, I was making some notes here. Um, you know, number one, and I'm putting, putting myself in, I mean, I'm already in the shoes of an innovator thinking through these in, in, in real time. You know, you're, you're confronting the price of working with a design firm, just going sequentially here. And, you know, you can go to the IDOs, you can go to the other big firms around here. There's a little bit of safety in that. You, you know, your investors aren't going to, fire you for hiring IDEO to like adapt the old IBM saying, um, but the big design firms are very expensive. Um, and, and, and they're expensive at a time when that capital really matters. So being able to offer um, similar quality services at a lower cost to the startup really matters. Um, you're always worried about design transfer, especially I think if you're working with a top tier firm that works oftentimes outside of med tech, you fear they're going to design the most beautiful, you know, functional thing in the world, and but you're not going to be able to scale manufacturing. So, working with someone who's, in some demonstrable way, able to think ahead to design transfer within the context of med tech is useful. And then you're also thinking about, you know, IP, supply chain, you know, long-term manufacturing costs. So I think if the value proposition um, of your ecosystem addresses all of those in a way that allows an early stage innovator to see how they're connected, how they're smoothly connected. That's, that's a bundle of value propositions that really resonate. Yeah, and, and someone made the, the comparison earlier to, you know, working, I, I think someone said, you know, the comparison isn't so much working, um, you know, well, again, thinking out loud here, there's in-house manufacturing, which works if you've got really high margin medical devices, maybe, it's only getting worse. Um, and then there's going to China, let's say, if you wanna mass produce, but that really, you know, that comes with a lot of concerns too. I'd much rather get on a plane and go to El Paso than be going back and forth to China. So I think that comparator is really valuable, especially in, in the time of when we don't know how long COVID will be a concern. I feel a lot better about the Texas flight than the China flight. No, and, and Ryan, you, you are completely right. I mean, one of the issues that we can secure having this partnership between Mexico and the U.S. 
is that we are uh, compelled of actually uh, respecting all the the intellectual property rights. Uh, that that right. that is something that uh, not China, not Eastern Europe, not other areas of Asia can actually secure, and we do have very clear rules about that. So so uh, that 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 is important. And and needless to say, uh, another thing that we have to to bear in mind is that innovation lives. At the end of the day, the innovation, and I remember and I recall my times when I was heading Bombardier, some of the innovations that were thought in Montreal, you know, mm -hmm. nice designs of tales of planes and things like that, when actually you began to do the implementation of the process in Mexico, you had actually the technical solution done by the people that was, lying, was standing in the line. Mm -hmm. So it's it's part of the reality check that we can provide, and that requires supervision. So then again, the supervision, if you have the manufacturing side on the Mexican side, you can have the supervision side on the Paso side. Mm -hmm. So these are economies of scale that very few regions in the world can actually can actually offer. So, uh, so the invitation is uh, to the audience that is here, if you have not been to the borderland, you should actually try to come and see the, the reality. We would be more than happy of actually organizing uh, visits and, and showing you the ecosystem. I guess that that is the end of uh, Bio El Paso Juarez, of the cluster that uh, that you are having, and of course the role that we in Chihuahua we have in collaboration with Borderplex Alliance and with the with the with the EDCs in Las Cruces as well. I, I would just add to to what Alfredo just said that uh, Ryan that. The, uh, the medical devices that went to China 30 years ago, which we suffered last year, their absence was, were the commodity ones, uh, masks, uh, ventilators, uh, things that, that, but the, the, since, since surgery became minimally invasive, the US, the IP in its vast majority remain in European, primarily US, in European and some Japanese hands. Not much of it went into China. And you can see them in the Shanghai fair, in fairs and in different fairs where they go there to try and secure all those products. They did go and made a jump into some equipment like MRI equipment. You know, there's 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 companies that are the exception. But the, the, uh, the uh, disposables, the one that allow, uh, say for, for uh, uh, <clears throat> interventions, most of that IP is still in the hands of the U.S. And, and, and uh, in fact, you know, I, in, in 97, I made the decision to concentrate on medical devices because we, we heard a, 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 we lost 82,000 jobs from Juarez to China between 1999 and 2002. And the jobs that remain were, it, some of the jobs, jobs that remain were the medical devices was was just an incipient start at the time, and that's what grew over the last 20 some years. Mm -hmm. But not, not everything else in medical, masks, gloves, gowns, all that went to China. The, the, uh, the true IP value remain still here. Okay? Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, most of our supplies, and we're having a, a very difficult time with suppliers right now with lead times, without exception, everything that I need to make my uh, medical devices is sourced in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Great. Well, we've talked a lot about the synergy of, of design and manufacture and the, the full life cycle. We haven't talked so much about the patient side. And, and one of the things that struck me was you have two areas on either side of the border with, with very large populations. Um, and, and I imagine physicians and, and hospital systems able to, to work with the innovators and, and test them. I wonder, Emma, if you could talk a little bit about um, how you're working with the, uh, the veterans and, and the hospital systems as far as clinical trials and, and patient experience and provider uh, experience. So healthcare is now the largest private industry in El Paso. And so that's that's great for us. We have invested more in healthcare, education, research, and service delivery over the last 20 years than in any other industry. And, and as a result, I think we've had some great, not only facilities go up, but recruits. Growing clinical research has been challenging. Um, 
I think that in a medically underserved community, we, we have a great population, but we're medically underserved. So sometimes it's difficult to get doctors who have to see so many patients to think on the research side. But the fact that we have two new medical schools. So now we actually have three medical schools in our region in Juarez, El Paso and Southern New Mexico. Um, we are growing that, that kind of investigator base, young physicians and dentists and others coming out of these institutions with some research um, background. And so we are seeing a growth in clinical research. As I mentioned, we recently got a grant from Bristol, Bristol Myers Squibbs to, to launch a clinical trials academy and we're training um, many clinical research coordinators now training PIs and helping sites go up. And I know that there's a great appetite in Juarez to grow clinical research as well. And so again, these are those seeds we're planting that we're not going to let go of, that we're going to make sure that we root this. And, and recently I've heard from one of our universities that wants to grow a clinical research center of excellence. And so these, these efforts are definitely taking root. And, um, and, and I do think that we have a terrific base. You, you mentioned the military and our veteran population. Uh, we've been doing some collaborative uh, clinical research grants with William Boma Army Medical Center to try to establish those relationships of military to civilian partnership in the clinical research space. And I think over the next few years, you'll see a, a real growth in those relationships in that area. Right. So working on the demand side as well as the supply side um, in that ecosystem. Um, any final comments from our panel before we close? Well, you know, ju just a short comment. Uh, we've had doctors from both sides of the border, from the medical school in El Paso, from the medical school, uh, school in Juarez, that had come to our labs to help us uh, on the design and, and uh, it, it just basically the feedback on some of the products that we've been designing. We haven't done have had anybody from El Paso in the last twenty some months. But prior to that, uh, we we have we had that uh, open to us, and and, and perhaps, uh, but uh, you know, uh, again, perception. Uh, when you see uh, that many people says that comes to Mexico to actually have uh, healthcare services, uh, that is that is not actually a, a true picture about the things that are happening. I mean, with the with the coverage of the medical system in the U.S. Uh, the, the distraction of actually coming to get some services in Mexico, it's actually disappearing. However, however, on the Mexican side, we do have some of the of the uh, uh, best hospitals uh, accredited in, in, in Mexico that actually receive grants from institutions like the Mayo Clinic and, 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 and others that actually can help to develop some uh, test trials, uh, not only with Mexicans, but also with U.S. or Canadian citizens. So that that uh, a medical tourism area it's not uh, only for you know uh, aesthetic reasons or dentists i mean you can actually get some some uh, uh, treatments in high level hospitals here in the mexican side and this is not only uh, um, uh, restricted to the to the border area so uh, i guess that the potential is there the only thing that we have to work there is the reglament the, all the regu regulatory issues that have to to go with that and, and of course the cost and the coverage by, by different assurance insurance companies. Understood. Well, we're about at the end of the time. I really appreciate all of the comments from the panel. It seems as though a very exciting opportunity for further development of innovation in bio um, El Paso Juarez. Emma, I'm going to turn it over to you for closing comments. Great. Thank you, Pat. Thank you so much for, for moderating and for all of the insights that you have given to Bio and Paso we tried to, to create a path forward. And, and thank you, Ryan, Alfredo, and Julio for your participation in this panel this afternoon. It's been great having you all. Um, thank you to all of the people who attended our panel sessions today and our Nurse Innovator Demo Day yesterday. Uh, Ryan was a, a great speaker with our Nurse Innovators as well. And so thanks again for your participation. We've had such a great series of conversations yesterday and today, ranging from the future of medtech to the innovation ecosystem, technology applications and resources, supply chain resiliency, and, and much more. As many of you know, the El Paso Juarez area is home to um, more than 40 medical device manufacturers, over 50 suppliers in this area, and a workforce over 40,000 people strong. 
So it is a formidable industry that we are working diligently to grow, not only in size, but also in value. Our mission is to support the needs of industry so that this industry can grow, become more resilient, and the impact of our region's workforce um, and economic development will be significant. We invite you to join Bio El Paso Juarez to continue to actively participate in these discussions and be part of this exciting industry. And we hope you will join us if you're here in this region at our event at the CITA in Ciudad Juarez for a reception to celebrate this year's summit. Once again, I'd also like to thank very much our event sponsors. This would not happen without you. Workforce Solutions Borderplex, VWR and CITA. And of course, a very special thanks to our title sponsor, RexMed. And that concludes our Bio El Paso uh, Juarez Summit. Have a great afternoon. I hope to see you in person soon, maybe even tonight at the CITA. You all have a great time and please be safe. Bye-bye.